Hey guys, how's it going? This is Miss Sinclair from University High School teaching AP World History and today I want to start us talking about World War I. Now this is a super interesting topic for lots and lots of reasons but it's something that you probably already have some prior knowledge about. So before I start going on and on about what you need to know about World War I, I want you to take a moment, pause the video and think, what do you already know? What's already familiar to you? What are your associations with it? What comes to mind? What sights do you see in your head? What sounds, what movies have you seen maybe? So today we're gonna to start talking about World War I. World War One is a fascinating topic. This deals with topics 7.2 and 7.3 in the AP curriculum about World War I. Specifically, I would like you to be able to explain the causes and consequences of the war. But we are going to start talking about the crisis of this imperial order between 1900 and 1929. So I think before I really jump into you know, what happened, how it led up to the war. Uh, I think there's a couple things we should think about in terms of historiography. So historiography is the study of historians talking about history. It is not actively doing history, looking at the past, but you're looking at what historians have said about the past. Now, in American history, one of the most debated, possibly the most debated topic in American history is what caused the Civil War. If you take a push with Dr. Hosmer, he will go on and on about the causes of the Civil War until your ears start to bleed. He'll have you read lots of different historians. And the reason why is because there's no clear answer. Was it slavery? But if it was all about slavery, why were the people in the North still so racist? Was it just economics? But if it was just economics, what about the whole slavery thing? Was it a mistake? Was it a westward, westward expansion? Historians have argued each of those things I have described. However, no topic in European history is more debated than the causes of World War I. We'll give you a little acronym. There's a few things you should need to remember. But infinite it seems historians have argued over what was the main cause like what was the number one thing that led to the war and i think one of the reasons why this war has been studied so extensively is because it seems like such a senseless war there was no need for it to happen it killed so so many people and it was so utterly destructive to the land, the psyche, and the society at large. This is also going to be our first truly global war as the colonies of these European powers are pulled into the battle as well. So there is a playlist on our Google Classroom of just World War I associated videos. There is a lot you can dig into this war. I really love World War I. I find it a fascinating topic. I think in many ways it's more interesting from a historical point of view than World War II because World War II from a historian's point of view is pretty straightforward. You had an evil guy named Hitler and he was invading and murdering everyone. The good guys stopped him. I mean, it gets to be more complicated than that as you'll see, but World War I is just, it's just absurd in the saddest possible way. Historians m have posited that in the future, we will not talk about World War I and World War II, but rather we'll go back to referring to it as the Great War because you can see how World War I directly leads into World War II. There's a great video by John Green, his Crash Course European, video, uh, European History video, where he argues that World War I isn't so nearly unexpected as we often talk about it in history classes that really if you look at the European region when weren't they at war right this idea of like oh they were suddenly at peace and then they're at war 
no, you have a time of increased intentions, um, a time of lots of internal unrest, that the idea of peaceful nations suddenly starting to murder each other is one that relies too heavily on an idealized sense of the past. It's a good video. I recommend you watch it. It's on the playlist. So let's start talking about the origins of the crisis in Europe and the Middle East. And we can point to the Ottoman Empire. So if you remember from Unit 6, we talk about how the Ottoman Empire is on the decline. The height of the Ottoman Empire was with Suleiman the Magnificent. And the Ottoman Empire was the major power in the medieval period. But now, now they're kind of pathetic. They're referred to as the sick man of Europe. There's the Eastern question, which is simply European states debating amongst themselves. Who's going to get what part of the Ottoman land, you know, when they finally kick the bucket? They are not considered a real viable threat. In fact, they have been propped up for the last hundred years or so by Europe because of internal European conflicts, right? They don't want Russia taking too much of the Ottomans' old territory. So better to keep the Ottoman Empire afloat to hold Russia's expansion in check. So the Ottomans are super weak. They are losing territory. Macedonia, Bosnia, Crete, Albania, Libya, Serbia, Bulgaria and Romania. Now, in the Ottoman Empire, we've already talked about this a little bit, we start to see a new group of people taking charge, the Young Turks, this group of young, educated military officers who overthrow Sultan Hamid II and enforce a constitutional monarchy. They are building up their nation again. And they're taking their cues from Europe. They're looking at the growth of European nationalism. That's specifically what we see in places like Germany. And they are building up the military. And one of the easiest ways to build up a national identity is to define who we are by pointing out who we're not. We are Turkish. That means we are not Armenian. That means we are not Slavic. It means we do not speak this language. We do not worship this God. So under this new regime, we really see ethnic minorities are very targeted. So between 1912 and 1913, we have the Balkan Wars of Independence. There's a reason why Balkanization is a term you learned last year in AP Human Geography and why the Balkans are a shatterbelt, why it seems like they are constantly at war with each other, is because in this small mountainous region, you have lots of different groups invading it throughout history, leaving lots of different cultural influences. So you have Muslims there, you have Christians there, you have Orthodox there, you have lots of different ethnic groups, lots of different languages. So after the Balkan Wars for Independence are successful, Several small Balkan states are created. They have self-determined creating their own state. Serbia is one of these states. And Serbia is dissatisfied with how this all turned out. They feel like they should have gotten more land. They are worried about the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So if you're looking at our map here, here's Serbia. Here's Austria-Hungary. They're worried that Austria-Hungary is on their doorstep and will be taking over them, that they will have just essentially freed themselves from one empire to be swallowed up by another. They view themselves as a Slavic empire, right? So ethnically Slavic. The other group of people who are really buckling down on this idea of a Slavic identity are the Russians. So what the Serbians are going to want is to create Yugoslavia, a joint Slavic state. So we'll see hostilities in the Balkans persist as new and unstable countries are plagued by internal nationality disputes. So that's setting the scene. I think it's also useful to remember that this is a time period where the powerful are dominant over the weak. But that creates a sense of 
paranoia for the powerful because they know what if the weak rise up against us at any time and a sense of oppression for the weak. So you have lots of internal tensions between these large industrial business owners and labor unions, socialist groups, between different ethnic groups as these nations solidify what it means to be a German, to be an Italian, between the different states as they are competing for influence on the global stage and economic prowess. You see conflicts in Russia with the persecution of the Jews. You see conflicts between European states. It's all just a mess. So the main causes of World War I. This is a handy dandy little acronym that I would recommend that you memorize. Um, so this is going to be taught in basically like every high school world history class when it comes to World War I. Now, obviously... World War One is a highly complex topic and saying, oh, no, there's just four reasons is way too simplistic. And as I said before, the causes are hotly debated. So in general, however, you can say that our main causes are militarism, the alliance systems, imperialism, and nationalism. So we see... I'm going to go over all these in depth, but generally you see nationalism, which is binding citizens to their ethnic group and leading those who are apart from their ethnic group to be viewed as sort of other and thus enemies. Alliances in the military system allows for the great powers of Europe, Britain, France, Germany, Russia, um, to devise plans to try and protect themselves from rivals. And Germany is our most powerful state in continental Europe now. I guess apart from Russia, but Russia is its own strange bear of a country. Germany is on the cutting edge of technology. They have this massive chemical industry. They have militarized and industrialized so rapidly. So if you look here, you can see this little image showing the main causes. And Sarajevo, right there, is going to be the spark that starts the war. So let's start by talking about militarism. With all of the new inventions of the Second Industrial Revolution, steel, chemicals, all that jazz, we're going to see new industrial weapons, artillery-level uh, weapons, naval for forces are growing steadily. War is viewed as a crusade for liberty or as long overdue revenge for past injustices. And it has been a long time since our last big war. You have lots of small skirmishes, right? When Germany or Prussia and Austria-Hungary go to war against Denmark for the Schleswig-Holstein region. I did not pronounce that right. I mean, these are small conflicts and they're pretty easy. All the other military activities have been happening out of sight, out of mind in the colonies. Thank you very much. So the last time we had a war that encompassed like all of Europe was Napoleon, right? So early 1800s. So people have forgotten about how awful war is. So war is glorified. One of the ways that the government is building up their industries by building up their military, it's also a way for them to show off, look how powerful I am, look how organized I am by having this great military. All right, next, alliance system. So the emergence of a new Germany disrupts the power balance in Europe. So you have... Uh, how do I want to say this? By 1907, most of Europe, Europe is going to be in one alliance or another. Essentially, there's a concern of, well, what if we did go to war? I need to be protected. So you have the Triple Alliance, also, also known as the Central Powers. Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy's in there too initially. The Ottomans are in there, Bulgaria. 
And then you have the triple entente, aka the Allied Powers. These are very confusing names because we'll have the Allied Powers in World War II as well. This is going to be Britain, Russia, France originally, Italy later, and also later Japan and the United States. So many people would argue that the alliance system was the most important factor leading to the outbreak of the First World War. Now, whether or not it actually caused the war itself, debatable. But the alliance system meant that once a spark was lit, there was no chance to put it out. (coughs) Sorry about that. The alliance system was cursed by inflexible military planning. So let's look at this map. You see here Austria-Hungary, Italy, Germany, then the Ottomans join in. You have Bulgaria and Serbia. So, right, Serbia is here, Bulgaria is here. Then on the flip side, you have France and Russia and Britain. So some states will stay neutral, Spain, Switzerland, the Scandinavian states. But in many ways, Europe's kind of like itching for a fight. They have these new militaries. They have highly developed railroad networks, but they have few cars. Armies had millions of soldiers and um, reservists, so you might as well put them to work. Mobilizing these relied on railroads running on time and running correctly, which will work fine if you're France or Germany and have a good railway system, but it will be bad if you are Russia and you have no railroads. So... That means when they finally declare war, Germany and France can mobilize their forces and get them to the Western Front very quickly, whereas Russia is going to take literally weeks to get their forces in order. Germany's plan was originally to defeat France in a few days and then move all their forces to the Eastern Front before Russia can mobilize, and frankly, it's not a bad plan. Next, imperialism. Imperialism. Imperialism is going to lead to this sense of competition between the nation states of Europe. It's a rivalry. Tensions are high between the alliance systems who are in the midst of imperialist rivalries over the lands not yet colonized. So you have this massive competition. Britain wants more land, but Germany wants more land. And this is one of the ways you show how powerful and successful of a state you are. How big is your empire? And colonists acted as resource providers and combatants. So this is what I mean when it's a truly world war. A lot of times people will be like, nah, uh like it's just Europe. Like I was at a world war. Well, because you had people from India fighting in France for the British army because you have Africa and Asia providing uniforms, foodstuffs, bullets for these militaries. The war wouldn't have gone on nearly as long as it did because uh, without these colonies. Colonists chose to participate in the war effort because they hoped to achieve independence after the war and were actually often promised this. If you help us here, we'll allow you to be free later. And of course, this doesn't happen. Finally, nationalism. You see nationalism all over Europe. We talked about how it leads to a new creation of Germany and Italy. We see it in Japan. You see it leading to the Balkan independence movements. Nationalism binds citizens to their ethnic group and leads them to kill people they view as enemies, right? So it's not just enough that we are British. It's that those Slavic people are terrible. It's not just enough that we are Prussian. It's that those other groups are enemies. It's These clear-cut lines are clearer than ever because before you had multiple ethnic groups and they'd fight against each other. But these ethnic groups weren't necessarily linked to governments. So the uniting um, nationalism act 
acted as a uniting force in France, Britain, and Germany. It gave them a sense of purpose, cohesion, support for the government. You can see the propaganda right there. Your chums are fighting. Why aren't you? Whereas in Russia, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, nationalism is going to be a dividing force. So connecting back to human geo, nationalism in France, Britain, and Germany acts as a centripetal force, whereas nationalism in Russia, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire acts as a centrifugal force. The reason is that in these large empires, you have lots of ethnic minorities and religious minorities. And since the governments and the more powerful ethnic groups have repressed, often violently, these minorities for literally centuries, governments cannot count on these minorities supporting them in the war effort. So this is a silly little video, horrible histories. It is going to be a, a silly song about the start of the war, looking at Nicholas, Tsar Nicholas II, King George of England, and Tsar Wilhelm II. And all these men are basically cousins as well. Okay, but let's talk about the actual start of the war. So, it all starts because of one angsty teenager. Yeah, you think your teenage angst is cute uh -huh, until it kills 17 million people. Gavril Princip is 19 years old. He's a Serbian nationalist and anarchist. He believes in a Yugoslavia, right? He wants Serbia to be part of a massive Slavic state. He apparently is a terrible shot. He is in this little anarchy group with a few of his other teenage buddies. And when Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand comes to visit Sarajevo, he and his buddies are like, ah, we're going to kill him. Like, this will be our big move. Right? He's an anarchist. Anarchy had been a political and ideological movement that had led many political leaders to be assassinated. So there's no particular reason why this assassination should lead to a massive war, but it does. So the actual assassination is absurd. Austro Franz Ferdinand is the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, if you remember, Austria-Hungary was considering sort of taking Serbia under its wing. So Franz Ferdinand is visiting Sarajevo. He's there with his wife, who is pregnant, and they're riding through the city. Well, you can see in that little gif down at the bottom of the screen, all of the assassins, how there's multiple assassins. And one person chickens out. Two people chicken out. One person throws a grenade and he misses. So first assassin has the bomb. He doesn't do anything. Second assassin is standing by the first one with a gun. He also does nothing. He chickens out. Third assassin throws a bomb, misses, and runs away. He takes a cyanide pill, but it's too old and doesn't work. So he decides he's going to commit suicide by throwing himself off a bridge into a river and committing su um, and drowning. But the river is dry, so he just lands in the mud and is arrested. So Gavriel Princep hears about the failed assassination attempt, and he's bummed, so he goes to get lunch at a cafe, thinking, man, like, we missed our chance, like, I'll never be able to make my mark on history, blah, 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 teenage angst. Well, Franz Ferdinand, rather than trying to, I don't know, go somewhere safe, his driver takes a wrong turn, and then they decide, you know, no, we want to go to the hospital, we want to see those other politicians who were uh, hit with the bomb. Like, let's see how they're doing. So they decide to stop and turn around right in front of the cafe where Gavriel Princep is just sitting and eating lunch. And he's like, this is my chance. And so he shoots him. And his wife commits murder. And suddenly, unbeknownst to him, he tips over a domino that 
is going to lead to all out war. So Austria, see if you can track this with me. This is called the July crisis of 1914. Austria-Hungary demands political and territorial concessions from Serbia. You killed our person, so you have to give us your land. Serbia is like, no, I'm not going to do it. So Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia and invades. Russia is supporting Serbia because of this pan-Slavic movement, right? So ethnically, Serbs consider themselves to be Slavic, just like Russians do. This is a movement in the 19th century aimed to unify Slavic peoples who had long been ruled by others. So Russia's like, Austria-Hungary, you can't do that. I'm on the side of Serbia. Well, austria hungary is like, I can't fight Russia by myself. Germany, get in here with me because we have an alliance. So now there's no more possibility of just a little regional war between Serbia and Austria-Hungary. Now that Germany is involved, that alliance system has clicked into place. So you have Russia mobilizing its troops against Austria. You have... France kicking it into gear as well because they are a ally of Russia. Germany mobilizes their troops and decides he's going to, they're going to invade Belgium on way to France. All right, so World War I starts on August 1st, 1914. It really was triggered by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary. First, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. That mobilizes everyone else. Germany invades Belgium on the way to get to France, and the British are now involved as well. They tell Germany to get out. And now we have a fight on our hands. So what led to the outbreak of World War I? What were the main causes of World War I? Who was in the Triple Alliance and who was in the Triple Entente? These are things you should be able to answer before we move on. But I'm going to move on anyway. So this is called the Great War. We're just going to talk about the war a little bit today. And we'll talk about the Russian revolutions in a separate lesson. Because that's a whole thing of its own. Historically, the fastest and most aggressive army won. And none of that's going to work here. It's Here's the thing about World War I. Is it starts when you're still using horses and bayonets. And it ends when you're using tanks and airplanes. You enter the war with the same sort of military strategies that worked for Napoleon. But it's not going to work. And instead, you're going to get this stalemate. So France tried to attack Germany and fails. And it really seems like Germany is going to win. Remember the Franco-Prussian War? There's still some bad feelings between Germany and France because of that. The fact of the matter is you don't have an easy win you have the Western Front instead, a line of trenches in World War I that stretched without a break from Switzerland to the North Sea. And it was the place where we saw most of the fighting between Germany versus France and Britain. And it's an ugly place. I mean, at this time, I think it's probably very pretty. But in the war, gosh, trench warfare was just the most terrible thing. There are lots of good movies that go along with World War I. Not as many as that go along with World War II because World War I is not nearly so heroic. But one that just came out that I wholeheartedly recommend you go see with parent permission because I think it's rated R is 1917. It's exciting and you see what life is like in those trenches. So 
you have four years of this stalemate. We'll talk more about the actual war itself, but here's the Western Front. And here's how fighting in trench warfare works. You dig a trench, a big hole in the ground. You sit there in the cold and the mud. And occasionally, your officer says, we're going to charge. And so you'd order your troops out to run straight at your enemy who is hiding in their own trench and just shoots you, right? There is nothing between your trench and their trench except for dead bodies, mud, and barbed wire. The space between the two trenches is called no man's land. It is terrifying. But in these charges, I mean, that's all you're doing. You're literally, I'm going to hop out of my trench. I'm going to run at the enemy and hope I don't get shot. And like, maybe, maybe we can get to their trench before we're all murdered. And then take the trench and then what? We've earned two miles maximum of territory. They do this for four years, four years. So the war itself, Germany's main concern is the fact that they have to fight a war on two fronts. Like, let's go back to that other map. Mm, Nope. Where's my other map I wanted? Nope, not that one. Aha. Sorry. So here's Germany. The Western Front is right here. They're concerned with the fact that France and Russia are allies. So they have to fight France in the West and Russia on the East. So what's the best way to practically do this so you don't, you know, just get invaded? Well, they come up with something known as the Schifflin Plan. And prior to this point, you have... Germany building up their military, um, men being drafted into the military. So they have a force that fights very well. So the Schifflin plan. First, you just blaze through Belgium and attack and conquer France. Then you turn east and fight Russia. Easy, quick. I think the thing to understand is that most people thought this war would be a quick little war. Like it happens in August, we'll be home by Christmas, right? It will be a fun little war. We'll be able to stretch our legs. We'll be able to like earn some medals. My wife will be so impressed. The ladies will love the scar on my cheek. It lasts for four years and it's an ugly, brutal affair. Ironically enough, the <laughs> Hitler uses a variation of the Schifflin plan And is very successful with it. But that's because he uses something called Blitzkrieg. He has tanks, he has air support, and he has all of his soldiers taking methamphetamines. And so they don't need the sleep. But they don't have that at this point. So instead, Britain supports its ally Belgium. And Japan supports Britain. They've been naval allies since 1902. And remember, Japan and Russia, not necessarily biggest fans of each other because of the Japanese-Russo war. So I think it's going to be a quick war, and it's just not. Germany did not have a quick victory in France. You have the establishment of the Western Front, where Germans are halted by the French on the Marne River. And this is such a new war, right? We have new types of of technology are being used every month Airplanes, tanks, poison gas, radio technology for the first time, machine guns, barbed wire. This is all brand new. So let's talk a little bit about trench warfare because it's just a horrifying affair. So first you have, first you have the pests, right? First, you have um, rats the size of cats, lice. The rats are huge because they're bloated on food and waste and corpses. They will bite the soldiers and spread diseases like trench fever. You have unsanitary conditions. It is constantly cold. It is constantly wet, which leads to something called trench foot. So imagine you've been in the pool for a long time and your foot gets all wrinkly 
Well, if you do that long enough, the skin will start to just come off your foot. And then you get, you start to lose feeling in it. It's a frost-like um, infection that can lead to gangrene as, you know, the skin comes off your foot and it just begins to rot and eventually amputation. And the thing about the thing about trench warfare that makes it so different from every other war is how boring it is. It is just dreadfully boring. You can't see the enemy. You're sitting in a cold trench knowing you can die at any time, right? You feel utterly powerless. You can't defend yourself against shelling, right? If an airplane drops a bomb on you, what are you going to do sitting in a trench? Or snipers, who might see the tip of your helmet sticking over the trench, or poison gases. So you have constant stress and exhaustion, but also paired with this incredible boredom. You're just sitting there waiting to die, essentially. It's horrifying. So this psychological strain is one of the reasons why it is so much more difficult than other wars. So you have the Battle of Verdun, where the Germans lost 281,000 soldiers, and the French lost 315,000 men. The Battle of the Somme, the French, nope, sorry, the British lost 420,000, 60,000 on the first day. Germans lost 45,000. The French lost 200,000. Guys, I don't know if you can fully grasp how how large those numbers are, right? Like, it's like half a million people. They lose half a million people in a single battle. Half a million. Entire, an entire generation is destroyed. It's a new form of warfare where no one can win. So here's a trench. You dig it down to the hole. You have small, like, sort of caves under, in, called the dugout, where you might be able to get some rest. You know, maybe, unless it collapses on you because they throw a bomb at you. You have the parapet, barbed wire, so occasionally you'll try and stick your head over the trench and fire. You, if you are looking at sort of the big picture, you have the trenches. You have no man's land. You have long-range artillery. These trenches would often be like feet deep in cold, wet mud. You have little clarity about what you're fighting for, who you're fighting. You are just sitting there waiting to die. It's such an ugly war. It's a new form of warfare where no, neither side can really win. So let me tell you a little bit about sort of a typical day in the trenches. A typical day in the trenches. So s- trenches are crowded. The toilets overflowed. You are going to have lots of diseases. So at 5 a.m., you stand to, which is short for stand for arms, meaning you're at high alert for enemy attack half an hour before daybreak. At 5.30, you get your rum ration. At 6 a.m., you stand down for half an hour after daybreak. 7 a.m., you get some breakfast. After 8 a.m., 8 to noon, you clean shelves, weapon, you tidy the trench. At noon, you get some food. After food is when you get to sleep. Then at 5 p.m., you have tea. These are the British. 6 p.m., you stand to half an hour before dusk. 6.30, stand down for half an hour. And then from 6.30 p.m. all night, you work. You patrol. You dig trenches. You put up more barbed wire. Soldiers only got to sleep in the afternoon during daylight and at night for an hour at a time. During the rest of the time, they wrote letters, played card games. It sounds so boring. This is a great little video clip from Warhorse. I recommend you watch it. 
but let's look at a bunch of graphs to try and make these numbers a little bit clearer. So casualties in the course of four years of war. Guys, I, Russia will lose the most, but Germany loses a lot as well. So the green lines are the number mobilized. The red lines are the number who died, then wounded or missing in action. Look at, we're at 12 million, 12 million Russians alone mobilized. So this is a great little infographic. We're going to look at some of the images from it. So 35 million men were casualties of war, killed or wounded. 15 million of them are dead. 20 million wounded. So to give you a couple senses of that, LA has about 15 million people in it. New York has 20 million so you can see that Russia mobilized the most. And after that point, it's, you're not going to get many survivors, right? So you have casualties of the allied forces and the central forces. So in Russia alone, they mobilized 12 million. Of that, they are going to see 1.7 million killed, 2.5 million prisoners, 5 million wounded, and just a few left who are alive. Germany is going to mobilize 11 million. They will lose almost 2 million. Then Britain, then France. Look at these numbers. These are astounding. Austria-Hungary, which will not be an empire by the end of this. Italy, the United States, Turkey, Bulgaria. It is shocking. So there's some primary sources that I'm not going to read out loud to you. But one, um, there are two poems. Um, I would recommend you look them up. One is called In Flanders Fields. Maybe I will read them to you. Let me see if I can get them pulled up soon enough. I'm sorry, I don't have them in front of me. In Flanders Fields is a very famous poem. It's also pretty short. So let me read this one to you. <clears throat> It's by John McRae. This is the most iconic poem sort of, of World War I. And it's a very, how do I say this? Nat nationalistic poem. So, sorry about this, guys. You're just waiting on me. Here we go. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amongst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from fa failing hands we throw the torch to you be yours to hold high. If I can get my, sorry guys. The torch be yours to, um, the torch be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Now, my rhythm for that probably was not right, but it's beautiful imagery, right? They're dying in the fields, but you will carry on sort of the torch of nationalism. Another point of view is a poem called Dead Man's Dump. So Dead Man's Dump is, let me get that out of your way. <laughs> Dead Man's Dump, as you might imagine, is not, um, a very pretty poem. The plunging limbers over the shattered track, racketed with their rusty freight, stuck out like many crowns of thorns and the rusty stakes like scepters old to stay the flood of brutish men upon our brothers dear. 
The wheels lurched over, sprawled dead, but pained them not, though their bones crunched. Their shut mouths made no moan. They lie there, huddled, friend and foeman. Man born of man and born of woman, and shells go crying over them. From night till night till now. Earth has waited for them all the time of their growth, fretting for their decay. Now she has them at last, in strength of their strength, suspended, stopped, and held. What fierce imaginings their dark souls lit. Earth, have they gone into you? Somewhere they must have gone and flung on your hard back is their soul sack emptied of God's ancestral essences. Who hurled them out? Who hurled? None saw their spirit shadow shake the grass or stood aside for the half-used life to pass out of those doomed nostrils in the doomed mouth when swift iron burning bee drained the wild honey of their youth. I'm going to skip ahead. <clears throat> Maniac earth howling and flying, your bow seared by the jagged fire, the iron love, the impetuous storm of savage love, dark earth, dark heavens, swinging in chemic smoke. What dead are born when you kiss each soul, soundless soul with lightning and thunder from your mind heart? Which man self dug his blind fingers loosed? A man's brain splattered on his stretcher bear's face. His shook shoulders slipped their load, but when they bent to look again, the drowning soul was sunk too deep for human tenderness. They left this dead with the older dead, stretched at the crossroads. Burnt black by strange decay, their sinister faces lie. The lid over each eye, the grass and colored clay, more motion they have than they joined in to great sunk silences. The poem is called Dead Man's Stump and it's by Isaac Rosenberg. And it is just describing the corpses, just the corpses, because that's what you're surrounded by is corpses. We have new forms of warfare where neither side can win. It's just death and blood. And you're just wondering why am I fighting this fight? Why did my king send me to die? The Western Front never moves four miles one way or another. Four years of fighting, and it doesn't move four miles. So at sea, you have new forms of warfare. The British Navy blockades the coasts of Germany and Austria-Hungary. Germany spent tons of money on a brand new navy, and they couldn't use it at all during the war because the British Navy blockaded it so quickly. So instead, the Germans use submarines, U-boats, another new invention, and they attack every vessel possible, including the British ocean liner, the Lusitania, which had a lot of Americans on it. The U.S. was like, hey, you can't do that. So the U uh, Germany agrees to stop attacking ships that have Americans on it because they don't want America to get into the war. Now we have airplanes. It's a brand new invention. Airplanes will be used for reconnaissance and engaged in spectacular but ultimately inconsequential dogfights over the trenches. But, of course, you also have poison gas. So this is an aerial view of the shell and bombardment damaged fields in Belgium. And look how deep into the mud that man is walking. But let's talk about the chemical weapons. Let's talk about the poison gas. So first you have chlorine gas, which is a greenish yellow cloud that smelled like bleach and irritates the eyes, nose, lungs, and throat. Not so bad, right? Except it kills you by asphyxiation because it binds to your lungs and you're not able to get in any oxygen. So, you know, it's like you're being strangled by the air. But we also have phosgene, an irritant, but more deadly than chlorine gas, ultimately, because it was colorless, right? You could see chlorine gas coming at you, and you could duck and hold your breath and try and wait it out. Soldiers would never be sure if they got a deadly go dose of um, phosgene because it would kill over the course of days as your victim's lungs slowly filled with fluid, and you would slowly suffocate to death suffocate to death so you would drown internally 
It was used by the Germans at first, but then the Allies really started using it a lot too. Finally, mustard gas, the king of battle gases. Its effects are not immediate either. It smelled terrible. But hours after exposure, a victim's eyes would become bloodshot, begin to water, and become increasingly painful, with some victims experiencing temporary blindness. Worse, your skin would begin to blister, particularly in moist areas like armpits and genitals. And as the blister popped, they'd become infected. As they became infected, they'd become gangrenous, which means you'd have to cut them off. Parts of your face, parts of your arms. Plus, mustard gas could conveniently contaminate the land. And once you were exposed to mustard gas once, you would be sensitized to it. So the next time you were exposed to mustard gas, a significantly lower dose could produce the same significant symptoms. It caused the highest number of casualties of all the chemical weapons, 120,000. But most of the time, these chemical weapons had limited usefulness because of the open air of the battlefield, right? Very quickly, the gas would diffuse among the air and most soldiers wouldn't necessarily get a lethal dose. Now, if the poison gas was used in an enclosed area like a dugout, well, then you're in trouble. Okay, this is a great video by Vox. It's about facial prosthetics during World War I. They didn't really have plastic surgery that was very effective. And so when you lost half your face because of the mustard gas, what could you do? Be stared at by children calling you a monster? Instead, many people would have prosthetic masks made. It's fascinating. I recommend you watch it. All right, what well, about the war outside of Europe? Only South America didn't participate in World War I. Troops were often recruited from the colonies, most often fighting for the Triple Entente. Troops were gathered once the Europeans realized the war would not be decisive or quick, and they promised independence in return for war support. So Germany's main support was the Ottoman Empire, who entered World War I in 1915 in the Gallipoli Campaign, where the French and the British tried to capture Istanbul, but failed. This is seen as a huge success for the Ottomans. Effective British blockades ensured that the Germans could not receive raw materials from their colonies, and many German trade ships were destroyed. The British dominions, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, contributed resources and thousands of soldiers to Great Britain. Look at that poster there. Boys, come on over. You're wanted, right? It's if you're a good British, you know, if you support the queen, Australians go over to war. China gets in on the action. They declare war on Germany in 1917, trying to break free of some of those um, spheres of influence. In Africa, the German East African colonies produce soldiers, increasing the inclusion of non-Europeans in European conflicts. In the end, Germany's African colonies will be conquered. Over a million Africans will serve in the war. And the United States grows rich off all of this. We stay neutral. You can't see me gesturing, but I'm putting quotation marks around the word neutral. But we uh, supplied France and Britain and made a lot of money because, you know, we're not just going to give you those supplies for free. And then we enter the war in 1917 and it causes our economy to boom. It causes industrial growth in the North, and that's a pull factor for African Americans to leave the South and move up to northern cities. Okay, I know this is a really long one, guys, but nice thing about video is you can pause it at any time. And we are, oh gosh, this is our last slide of notes, so we are almost there. Um, so, the war in the East and in Italy. Russia is going to focus primarily on Austria-Hungary, but they will be easily defeated <laughs> by German troops. Oh guys, Russia. Russia is such a tragedy at all times. Russia's army is made up of illiterate serfs who are basically slaves and living like they did in 1600. They had no real weapons because they had no real factories produ to produce things like, I don't know, guns, bullets, shoes. So these aristocratic generals who often didn't even speak Russian commanded millions of poorly trained peasant soldiers. It was so badly planned. 
So, for example, they were like, aha, we're going to war. We need to stop buying guns from Germany. But they still expected to buy the oil to make the guns work from Germany. And when Germany was like, no, it's like, well, shoot, I guess we're out of weapons. Most Russians didn't have sufficient guns to fight the war. They would just be told to leave the trench and run at the Germans to fight with their bare hands. It's it's the turning point. It's enough to make the serf say, no, we're out. So in 1917, you'll have the Russian Revolution and it will overthrow Tsar Nicholas II. Vladimir Lenin will now be in charge and he will withdraw from World War I early, signing the Treaty of brest Livosk, which ceded lots of Russian territory to Germans. This means that Germany can focus all of its efforts on the Western Front and it would have won. Germany would have won. Except the Americans enter at that point. In 1915, Austria-Hungary crushes Serbia, but struggles against Russia. Same thing, inept generals, multi-ethnic armies who aren't loyal to the Austrian emperor. In 1915, Italy switches sides. Britain promises them territory from Austria-Hungary if they switch. And they're like, sure, we'll take Slovenia. Most of the Italian assaults against Austria-Hungary ended in disaster. And they had a huge number of deserters. And in the end, Italy was like, but like, why didn't we get Slovenia? Like, why? why you told us we would get Slovenia and you didn't give it to us. It's like, well, you didn't do anything. So for our summary, I would like you to explain the causes and consequences of World War I and explain how governments used a variety of methods to conduct the war. Hmm. Cool, 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 cool.